Howdy everyone and welcome to the Serial Geek TV YouTube channel. My name is James Etock and today I present to you something special. Back in 2003 to 2006, I was a co-producer on the UK He-Man and the Masters of the Universe DVDs produced by Contender and Cheerful Scout. For one of the special features, I conducted an interview with Filmation storyboard artist and writer Robert Lamb. Well over one and a half hours worth of footage was shot, but for the DVD I edited the interview down to roughly 40 minutes. A while back I mused that showing Rob's interview in all its glory with new accompanying visuals would be a rather wonderful addition to this channel. Fans of animation and the history of Filmation will love this given that Rob thoroughly enjoyed his time at Filmation and had much to say. This is the second part of the interview recorded back in 2004. Enjoy! Okay, let's talk about the um, process of storyboarding and what, why it is a vital part of the animation process. Whenever I tell somebody that I worked in animation, they'd ask me about what shows I worked on. And did I do it when I tell them I worked on He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, I'll say, oh wow, did you draw He-Man? Which part of the end we'd watch an episode or something and they would, uh, especially uh, kids, would ask, did you draw this part? Did you draw that part? And it was very hard to explain that no one person did all of one part of a cartoon. That uh, it's a collaborative process that hundreds of people work together to create this uh, animated show and the difficulty is making it look seamless, that it looks like the work of one artist. All the background paintings are, are done in a particular style, so they all match and are harmonious. The animators have to keep the drawings consistent. They work on, off model sheets so that uh, everybody draws He-Man the same way. And that can be a bit of a struggle. I, I remember at the beginning of each season, if we had done a more cartoony show, say like Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids, uh, after drawing that for, for about eight or nine months, the animators would have a really hard time doing a, a realistic action adventure show like He-Man or She-Ra because the disciplines are different and it'd take a, a while to get back into the, the swing of things. The, the whole point though was to make it all look seamless. You wouldn't see five or eight different versions of He-Man on the screen. The uh, part that I played as a, as a storyboard artist or production storyboard director was to interpret the script visually. We'd get a 30 page script, looks very much like a shorter version of a feature film script, and we'd be given uh, character models in some cases. In some cases we would have to storyboard the uh, episode without uh, models being finished yet. Uh, which was the case with the uh, House of Shakoti board that I uh, worked on. I didn't have models for uh, uh, the archaeologist Malakva, and so I created my own models, which uh, uh, didn't look anything like what was used. And later, when we did revisions, uh, that character was replaced in, in my uh, storyboard panels. The uh, uh, job of a storyboard artist is to read the script, visualize it, sketch it out in uh, uh, sequential form on uh, a series of panels, much like a comic book or a comic strip, only it's a series of panels to describe an action. Uh, it's not like a comic book in which one panel describes a whole scene and, and, and each individual panel kind of sits by itself. This, uh, this process has a um, as a way to tell the story visually. The storyboard functions as a blueprint for production for the rest of the studio. They always go back to the board and say, this is what, how, what you're doing in animation or you're doing in background, this is how this fits into the whole thing. And the storyboard is the visual blueprint for building an animated uh, TV show. The uh, uh, responsibilities of a storyboard artist is to um, is to tell the story visually, dramatically. Sometimes the script, when you have a really good script, it's well thought out and, and the writer is, has a visual sense, it makes the job a lot easier because there's, it's very clear what needs to happen. Uh, often, however, 
sadly to say, uh, many writers are not as visual, at least not in the animation medium. And they will um, uh, sometimes just leave a sentence describing something that ends up taking 10 to 12 board pages. I, I remember a Fat Albert script I boarded once in which um, uh, the Cosby kids were chasing uh, a kidnapper who had grabbed one of their friends. And the line in the script that gave me fits was the, um, uh, the stranger darts into an alley and eludes the gang at every turn. That was one sentence. Probably took all of 30 seconds to type. Took me two days to, to storyboard that sequence. And it was basically a chase. I am, you know, I had to think about uh, going down alleys, jumping over trash cans, climbing over fences, all that kind of stuff. None of that was described in the script. It turned out to be one of the most successful sequences in that episode. I got a lot of compliments on it, but it was completely imagined on the drawing table. And that happened quite frequently. We'd also have uh, nightmare descriptions like, uh, uh, you know, He-Man looks up and there's a thousand warriors on the top of the hill. Well, we can't do that. And we'd have to uh, reduce it down to a, a much smaller band for production purposes. But those kind of things are, are decisions that are creative decisions that are made by the storyboard artist. Uh, in conjunction with the, uh, uh, the director of that episode, generally what happens is the, uh, uh, the artist gets the script uh, reads through it, figures out what it wants to do, and, and then starts boarding, uh, uh, working out the sequences, the camera angles. The uh, It's really almost uh, comparable to a live-action director like Steven Spielberg or, or Martin Scorsese or Alfred Hitchcock because you're basically telling the characters where to stand, how to act, all these things are being uh, determined in the storyboard phase. Some live action directors do it. I know Steven Spielberg, George Lucas used a lot of storyboards. Albert Hitchcock used a lot of storyboards. Uh, and they would work together, uh, the director telling the artist what he wanted to see. Well, in, in the case of, of animation, the, the storyboard artist, and like I said, these days are, story, are many times called the storyboard director, directs the episode on paper. Now, after, uh, at that time in the filmation system, we go through an entire storyboard, and after we, fin we had uh, a certain number of weeks to uh, finish it, and then it'd be turned over to a uh, storyboard supervisor. At that time, it was uh, uh, Bob Arkwright, and uh, he would go through it and look at what worked, what didn't work, uh, was there a way to <clears throat> say this more economically, and so on, and, and he would send back a list of revisions, we'd make changes, then it'd go to the uh, episode director who, you know, might have some other ideas on how to stage things and he would put his input in and we'd make those changes. Sometimes I'd fight for the way I had something uh, staged and other times the director might have a, a much better idea. So we, we it's a collaborative process uh, and even the director would be answerable to um, the producer in, in during He-Man, that was Hal Sutherland. And Hal had particular views on how to stage things, both for economy purposes, but also for storytelling purposes. And uh, I know in a, at that time, it felt like everybody and his brother would have some say-so as for how the board would come out. So uh, we would joke about, um, did you get the janitor set of revisions? Did you get the receptionist set of revisions? Everybody in this studio seems to have to, something to say about our boards. But um, the idea was to make a better show. Sometimes the changes made the shows better, sometimes they made them worse. You do what you can. The storyboard artists had uh, some flexibility over changing uh, or editing parts of the script. We could not change the intent. We could not uh, call for new lines to be uh, added, but we could delete lines. We could change the order of, of lines. Uh, in some sequences, you might need a uh, you know simple thing like, watch out, duck, do this, <clears throat> and, and different 
small phrases and sounds, we could, as we stage the action in a battle scene, we could move some dialogue around. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we would have to do some severe cuts because the show would run long. Either the script was long or when adding the action, the thing would run more than the allotted time and we'd have to go through and, and extract scenes and delete scenes and so on. I started hearing about He-Man in 1982, probably in the fall. Um, close to, in fall going into Christmas of 1982. I remember uh, hearing that uh, Filmation was working on this project with Mattel Toys and uh, that um, is based on some toy characters, some action figures they had. When I heard about it, I uh, went looking, found um, a DC comic uh, adaptation or, or uh, early story, uh, I think a couple of issues. Saw what the characters looked like. I looked in the toy store, saw what the characters looked like, and, and said, oh, this could be interesting. This could be really fun. Um, it's too bad that Filmation is doing it. That was my thought at the time. I was young. I was wanting to, I still wanted to get on at Disney and, and I was uh, not sure what to expect. Although I was rather pleased with what we did in 1981 on the uh, uh, Saturday morning series Black Star. And that gave me hopes that well, Black Star looked pretty good. So maybe we can, maybe we can pull this off. Uh, the idea of doing a TV show based on toys was um, completely different. Usually toys came as a, as a, uh, a spin-off of a, off of a movie or a comic book or a TV show. So this was a little bit different. The, uh, uh, the thing that was really exciting to me was that we were creating something absolutely new and different and in a format that was new and different. Up until He-Man uh, debuted in the fall of 1983, Saturday morning TV was, was pretty much the primary playing field for animation. Uh, there were cartoons in the afternoons when kids got off from school, but that was primarily reruns of, of Saturday morning series. In order to have a minimum run in syndication, you needed programming for 13 weeks. Five days a week times 13 weeks comes out to 65 half hour shows. That was huge. So here we are, we're looking at a, a huge order of 65 episodes for one series. A huge volume of work. We, uh, we had to do things differently because uh, uh, we were used to just doing a very short run of episodes. And I, I talked earlier about uh, uh, the stock system and the same ass system in order to uh, make that feasible. But I was really excited about the, the possibility. For one, uh, I was a real fan of, of science fiction and fantasy and sword and sorcery and He-Man had it all. Uh, we had magic, we had uh, spaceships and, you know, ray guns and flying devices. We had a sorceress, we had um, strange and unusual locations and characters and, and it was really interesting. Uh, I would have to say that my, uh, uh, my first initial disappointment was, was when the uh, first time I heard Skeletor's voice and the interpretation uh, from from reading the the uh, preliminary material seeing the stuff in the in the comic books and on the toy shelves i had envisioned skeletor as being this powerful really evil guy and a lot of us wanted to just really play up this dramatically be uh, much like the lord of the rings was done uh, recently do it seriously and not not just trying to be funny. Uh, we were very disappointed when we heard uh, Skeletor's uh, high um, nah, 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 kind of voice because we, we were thinking more of a Darth Vader deep and menacing, uh, uh, I will get you He-Man instead of this, I will get you He-Man. <sighs> that was a big letdown. 
Uh, and it took a while for us to get over the fact that, that Skeletor was being portrayed in the scripts uh, more comical than menacing. And uh, uh, later when I uh, wrote a, uh, a sequel to The Cosmic Comet, I wrote uh, Capture the Comet Keeper. Capture the Comet Keeper, I uh, tried to re-inject a more menace into, uh, into Skeletor's character. And one of the, 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 the notes on, on my script from uh, Arthur Nadell, the uh, uh, head, head of the uh, creative department of the, of the writing department, he says, Skeletor is not the devil. I mean, it is a, he, I had made him really menacing. So I had to take it back and make him more comical so that because that's what had been established and that's the way he was going to be. That's not the way I wanted it, but that's the way he is. Uh, after a while, we grew to uh, enjoy uh, Skeletor once we finally gave up the fact that he wasn't going to be uh, this evil, evil, monstrous villain, that he was going to be kind of a buffoon. We kind of dealt with it and in some cases embraced it. To be continued.